to our uh, oversight committee for the North Northeast Housing Strategies. I'm Dr. Stephen Holt. I have the privilege of chairing this particular group. I was holding um, our moments, waiting for some other of our committee members to make it so that we'd have a quorum in order to vote on what we need to vote for tonight. But I don't want to hold up our process. And so we are going to begin by going through um, what our agenda has laid out. I'm also going to forego getting feedback on the one page updates. We'll do that at the end of our time tonight. So um, if everyone has signed in, I hope you have two uh, kind of directives or instructional uh, elements. One is functional. That is the restrooms are right back uh, over here. And then secondly, if you've signed up, hopefully you have an agenda and we're going to go through um, the items that are on the agenda. Now, this is a meeting of the oversight committee that is open to the public, to public members who are here. Thank you for being here. Provided you'd like to share, talk, testify at the end where it says public comment, I would ask that you direct your comment to the things that are on the agenda for the evening. If there are other things that are concerned for you related to what's happening in housing, what's happening with affordable housing, what's happening around gentrification, displacement, et cetera, there are some Portland Housing Bureau staff members here and a staff member of the mayor that is here. If you'd hold your hand up, everyone that's represented, Portland Housing Bureau staff, oh. thank you. And you can look around the room and grab one of these informed, capable individuals to talk about what might be on your heart. So with that being said, we're gonna begin and we're gonna start with the Interstate uh, Habitat for Humanity condo project. So Mr. Mezzanetti, would you come and join us? Thank you, Chair Holt and members of the committee. Appreciate uh, all of the work you do and the time we have on our agenda. This is um, I've spoken here before, but I'm Steve Messinetti. I have the privilege of serving as the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Portland Metro East, and I am here with some of our team, Michelle Rosa Bosa, who's a Habitat's homeownership program manager, and we'll be speaking some to that side of our work with families and partner agencies. And Josh Felipe is our construction director, who will speak more to our role as the general contractor and developer on our projects. I do. Okay, just want to make sure you have it. I have it. Good to know. And we're here to talk about a project on Olin Street in North Portland that Habitat was awarded funds through the March NOFA to build. And here is a kind of elevation of the project. We um, will be building the 12 home project and it'll be a mixed income project that provides um, families from 35% of the median income, so families that make as little as about $30,000 a year, up to 100% median income with homeownership opportunities. Here's a um, just floor plan of one of the floors of the site, so you can kind of see how it's laid out. Uh, what you see here is two homes side by side with a party wall down the middle. And um, all 12 of the homes on this site will be three bedroom homes with two full baths. Um, four of the units, which will be the first floor units, will be fully accessible. Um, so this is the first floor of one of the buildings and there'll be an identical building to this next to it, um, which also has two three bedroom homes on the first floor two three-bedroom homes on the second floor and two three-bedroom homes on the third floor. It's located um, in North Portland, as I said, right on the corner of Olin and Lombard. And it's right across the street from the River Gate Community Church, which has been a, a long-term partner of Habitats, actually. They, um, about six years ago, sold us the back half acre of their church property, and we developed 12 homes, which you can see them in this picture actually, um, 12 homes about five years ago on that site, and all of those families are still there and doing really well. Um, so this site is just across the street from there, um, just around the block from Columbia Park, and um, what we've found, heard from our families is that they really love being there. Um, 
some notes on here, which don't necessarily go with the pictures. Um, note is that uh, part of the NOFA was that the homes remain permanently affordable. And in this case, we'll have 10 of the homes that are permanently affordable to families up to 80% MFI. Um, and this is something new, is that two of the families will be, two of the homes will be permanently affordable, but up to 100% MFI. So it'll be a, a higher cap for that moderate income buyer in the future. Let me turn this over to Michelle to talk about our families we'll be serving. Yeah, so, so a minimum of six of the homes will be sold to home buyers that uh, make between 35 to 60 percent of the area medium income. Uh, these home buyers will be working with Habitat through our pr traditional program model. Uh, at least a maximum of four homes will be sold uh, to home buyers making uh, 61 to 80 percent of the area medium income, and then a maximum of two homes will be sold. Uh, to homeowners uh, between 81 and 100 percent MFI. All of these home buyers will be going through the preference policy, and then uh, they'll be working uh, with uh, homeownership counselors uh, and receiving support from one of our partner agencies in the All Collaborative. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Michelle. So what's, um, I think you probably know this now, is what's unique about Habitat is, um, unlike many of our nonprofit partners, we're, um, we're the agency that works with the families and does some housing counseling, but we're also the developer, uh, as well as the general contractor, and that provides some opportunities for us to keep these homes affordable. Um, so on this, um, we have a team, we do have an architect, Ankur Moyesen, who designed these homes, as well as um, they'll be permanently affordable, and we'll work with Proud Ground as our partner to maintain the affordability for future resales and then as Michelle said um, our partner agencies through the A collaborative to also work with families to get them ready to buy homes and this is actually just a photo of, of Tanya who we're working with right now outside of this program to buy a home this year with Habitat and a great example of how because we're the builder and we have the families identified early we're able to build her a home that's fully accessible that meets the specific needs that her daughter has uh, which is a real need in our community to have more homes that are are accessible and meet families needs we turn it over to Josh to talk about the, the, the homes yeah so um I have the privilege of uh, supervising the construction department here at Habitat. And one of the things um, that is great is that we spend a lot of time researching all the products that go into our homes, even those that, you, that are behind the walls that you don't even see. Um, and we get the best product that we possibly can. Um, so with that, you'll see the luxury vinyl flooring up there. That is scratch resistant. It is waterproof. Um, we control the indoor ventilation, uh, so the homeowners always have fresh air. Uh, there's humidistats that, we, that are installed in the bathrooms, so if the humidity in the bathroom gets above a certain level, the fan will turn up even higher uh, to help remove that moisture. Uh, go into the exterior, um, using hardy plank siding, is, it, it lasts a long time, is extremely durable. Um, and then, uh, as uh, Steve spoke to a little bit, the ADA units, there's four ADA units in this uh, project, and we get to involve the, the family in the decisions that they need, um, of what they, their needs around um, uh, th their homes. Um, go to the next slide, sorry. And then speaking of the finishes, um, a lot of these finishes, uh, low-income builders get the cheapest product they possibly can find, and um, we like to give our homeowners some choices. There's, there's color choices in the cabinets, the countertops, uh, the flooring, uh, even uh, in carpeting upstairs. Those four ADA units, um, they will have tile on the floor in their bathrooms, so the homeowner's gonna be able to choose um, that color also. This is one award that I am very proud of, um, to be able to uh, be at an organization that is really conscientious about sustainability, about building green. Um, Earth Advantage is a third party inspection um, a verifier that they go through homes and make sure that there's water sense fixtures so the families aren't consuming more water than needed. Um, 
all of our light fixtures are LED um, light fixtures. Uh, going out to the outside, you have your landscaping that is drought resistant, uh, grasses and, and native plants. Um, and even managing the stormwater on site um, is, is a huge savings for the families. Um, so they, they, they get the savings of their monthly utility bills and with low um, maintenance on these buildings. And then being Habitat, um, we get to um, engage with the community um, by having volunteers work on our, our projects um, with upwards of 15,000 hours and engaging uh, 2,000 volunteers. As the builder, we're also, as the builder, um, we also are able to bring some unique subsidies to a project. Um, so we have partners that provide some of the building materials that we use. Um, Whirlpool donates every refrigerator and stove to Habitat nationwide, which is a great benefit to us. Locally, Malaki Roofing gives us high quality 50 year roofing for all the projects we build in the community. Northwest Natural has donated tankless high efficiency water heaters um, and there'll be others as we get further into the project. Uh, we'll also have corporate support. Here's a picture of a, a team from a, a local company that comes out and, and volunteers for the day and provides their support, both volunteer labor as well as financial support. And then we will um, also apply to other public agencies, the SHOP HUD program, self-help opportunity program through HUD. Most of our homes were able to access some funds through that program. There's some state programs and others that we'll apply for. And um, I think what's key here is we've designed the program to the numbers that Michelle went through, that a minimum of these, of these homes will be sold to families under 60% MFI. Um, but we're intentional about that being a minimum. What we've learned in working with the preference policy families is that a majority are coming in at that lower income. So um, ideally, we'll even find additional subsidies than those we have now that can increase that number to more than just half of the units being at that lowest income. We also have long-standing partnerships with local uh, apprenticeship programs. We were actually around in helping start Youth Builders over 25 years ago, and they work with us every year, year in and year out. Uh, Tivnu is a local program we also helped start a number of years ago that involves Jewish youth. And uh, we have a Women Build program and other apprenticeship programs. The Habitat site is just a great, great place to, to learn how to build. We also have... Um, made it a high priority. Um, for um, What's unique about Habitat Sum is there's not as much opportunity for hiring subcontractors because a lot of the work's done by volunteers. But, but we still hire out quite a few contractors for the electrical, plumbing, mechanical, and things like that. Um, so for all the hiring out we do, we've, in our current project, 43% went to MWSB contractors, um, which is about $23,000 per home. We have made uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion a high priority for the organization. We've always had a real high number of families who were households of color. It's over 90% of, in terms of our buyers. Um, but in recent years, we've also made that a high priority in our hiring practices, in our board recruitment. Um, this past year, 59% of our hires came from that Section 3 qualified candidates, and 21% of our new hires were people of color. You all have seen this before. These are specific stats for Habitat for Humanity in Oregon. 92% of kids who grow up in a Habitat home graduate, which is 17% higher than the state average. 70% um, of their families, through a survey we did, um, said their kids' grades improved after moving to their Habitat home. 90% say their children are finding a quiet place to study in their new home. Um, this past year, 38 people with disabilities were served by Habitat here in Portland, and 80% um, of them said they can't imagine moving. Uh, we, we find, um, even nationally with Habitat, very few of the buyers of our homes sell in their lifetimes. It usually gets passed down to their kids. And in terms of the schedule, this is a project that um, we purchased the land soon after the NOFA award and working through that process. We just recently completed the demolition of the house that was on the site and clearing the site and getting rid of an oil tank and so forth and are now in the permitting process, which we hope to have a, a permit by February, and, and we'll get started right after that. Um, this is scheduled out for, for sales um, by, by November, and that's really more based on when we have families ready to buy them um, rather than when we can have the homes finished. 
And that is our presentation. If we have a few minutes, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Virgie or <laughs> Dr. Bates, any questions or comments for Habitat? Could you, um, thank you. Could you um, talk a little more about the timeline that you just went over where the purchase of the home is November 2019? Is that when the applicants are going to be able to um, secure a loan? Is that what that's tied into? Yeah, sorry, I, I kind of ran through the schedule quickly. So we'll start construction as soon as we get the permits. Hopefully that's in February. and. By June next year, we would then have those homes completed, and we'd go, those would be ready to sell. So any buyers that are ready to sell, we'd be able to sell then. Later this evening, there's going to be a discussion around which preference policy round families will be allowed to purchase these homes. So if they're the current preference policy families, they'll be able to buy, buy them sooner, and we'd be able to sell them sooner. If it's the next round, which I think we're anticipating wouldn't get selected until this fall, it's probably more like next fall that they'd be ready. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you. Steve, thanks for this presentation. Um, I had made a note here that um, we've had a conversation about the missing middle, mm -hmm. and a lot of people have having conversations about that. So seeing that there's going to be some 80 to 100% uh, MFI units there, because by no means does that mean someone's able to afford a house um, in this environment now. Um, this, so the question I have is in regards to um, the ownership model and the, the unit makeup, um, it looks like it's um, like a shared roof. Is that going to lead to like an HOA for these homeowners? It will, so these will be in a condominium ownership format, so there'll be a, an HOA that they collectively own their building, and there's a reserve account that they pay into, which is taken into account in terms of our pricing um, and their payments. And th that reserve account will be the money that's needed to replace that roof in 30 years to paint the siding every 10 years, et cetera. So, um, so that reserve account will cover all the overhead costs for anything that occurs in the home or? Only the exterior of the units. So families are still responsible for all of their interior kind of drywall in, appliances, mm -hmm. flooring, et cetera. But if there's any problems to anything exterior in the buildings, that would be covered by the HOA payments and the reserve study that is okay. done each year. So I assume that you already have an outline of how to communicate this to the families because this home ownership model might be sure. new to a lot of them. And it's, uh, it's good, but it's non-traditional in a lot of senses. Absolutely. Um, for the past 13 years, almost all of the homes we've built in Portland and Gresham have been condominium projects. So the first was in, in well, one right across the street from here five years ago. Um, 14 years ago, we did our first in the Cully neighborhood. And um, we have a whole round of classes that we have professionals from the condo management companies come in and provide. We also work very closely with the buyers during the first year of ownership to transition to them as leaders of their HOA and provide them with the training they need to be good leaders of their HOA. So we have partnerships with HOA management companies that we highly recommend that we set up with the families that work closely with them as well. Good questions. I have another question on the page where you had standard features. Um, is there any type of uh, safety items that will be in the units? Fire alarms, um, they're not mentioned, but I think they're very important. Absolutely, uh, fire alarms are, are code, so we, they have to be put in. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also installing CO2 monitors, um, and really, uh, it, they are very safe homes. Um, the other question is for those that live on higher floors, second, I think you said in some places, third floors, what type of exit uh, do you have in mind if something were to occur below them or on their level, how do they safely get out? 
Yeah, there, um, so in between the floors and all the walls, the common walls, there's a, a two hour firewall. So that's gonna slow down any fire going to any other unit. Um, inside those walls are also a, acoustic uh, sound proofing in the walls. So a lot of noise isn't transferred. But uh, as far as fire them escaping, um, we will we'll have to install some type of a, a ladder that can go out a window. Um, there will be two exits uh, out each, each um, not each unit, but once you get up a little bit, there, um, there's, there's a, a hallway. Well, no, you'll be able to get out. I'm sorry, I'm confusing another project. Um, <laughs> there's a door, front door you'll be able to get out of safely, and then egress windows in all the bedrooms that they'll be able to get out there. Is there any plans for safety drills with the family so that they know how to use the items to, for their best uh, needs to be met in case of an emergency? Classes we do. Yes. First aid and Red Cross. So we offer a slew of pre-purchase as well as post-purchase classes. Some of the classes that uh, we offer to homeowners before they buy are home maintenance, protecting your investment, financial education, uh, understanding HOAs and mortgage education. And then in terms of post-purchase, so after they purchase a home, uh, we offer another slew of classes, including uh, uh, emergency preparedness classes, uh, writing your will, things like that, that we've found is uh, helpful for our homeowners. No other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate the work and the effort. Diane Lynn, proud ground. Good to see you. Clicking right here. I'm going to advance this forward for us. There we go. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present this. We really look forward to this opportunity. Um, here with me tonight is Gina Woolley. You'll be hearing from her in a few minutes about some very important components of the project. Um, thank you for your attention, and we're, we appreciate uh, the chance to really explain what we have in mind here for this project. It's uh, located at 5020 North Interstate Avenue on the corner of uh, Alberta and Interstate. Um, it's a, uh, a conceptual project at this stage. We wanna make it very clear that what we're, we're presenting here tonight uh, came from our proposal that was submitted to the city of Portland in response to the NOFA request in the same cycle that you just heard from Steve about. And um, so there will be components of this that are very likely to change when we get really into the details of the project. So we will be back to explain what changes are, are expected. And in fact, this rendering uh, is likely to also change. This gives you a flavor for the project. So these are the, these, this is the overview of the project. The highlights are this are 50 units. This is a standard uh, five-story condo building uh, on a 20,000 square foot uh, lot. Um, it's a dilapidated site right now, so we're looking forward to the upgrade of that, uh, that space, which, by the way, is just two blocks from our, our offices at Proud Ground, so we're in the neighborhood ourselves. Um, we are planning on 20 parking spots, uh, about 1,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, if, you know, the, the project budget provides, we'd like to have space for the community to be able to use and the people in the, in the building to be able to have access to it. 1,400 square feet of enclosed plague place space because we're expecting to accommodate a lot of children in this in this new building. This uh, chart gives you a flavor for the affordability levels of the units that we're creating here and these are average prices for the size units, uh, bedroom size units that we're scheduled to, uh, to build. And um, as a contrast we brought just, um, and some of you may have seen this business journal at uh, description of the hottest neighborhoods in Portland. It goes through a series of them. And the Arbor Lodge, Kenton, which is a, a 97217, is 
generally the area of the interstate, um, and its average prices are 240 or 224,000. Um, sorry, 424,000. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a little different. Yeah, 424,000 with probably the family size units, some are available in the mid 300,000s. These units are clearly considerably less than that and we'll be working very hard to bring an additional subsidy from other sources beyond what the city's providing us to hold these affordability levels to meet the needs of the preference policy families we're working so hard to uh, get into this building. So there's, uh, as you heard about last month, a lot of uh, market pressure on, on this part of the community and this will be a building and you'll hear from Gina in a few minutes about uh, the, the benefits to the community it will be providing. Uh, part of the project so far has been really uh, augmented by the team of people that we've pulled together. Um, Prague Ground is the lead sponsor. At the same time, we're going to be relying on the expertise of a wonderful group of professionals. Uh, starting the first person I went to talk to about the project was Steve Messinetti, who who is obviously here tonight, you've heard from him. This project, we're taking the lead on, we're supporting them and the projects they're doing. And um, together we, uh, I think, uh, have bring a lot of expertise in this uh, whole arena and 17 years of experience providing uh, families with this kind of support, pre-purchase, post-purchase, and we work with families of color primarily. Um, so Habitat is a lead partner. Uh, GM Woolley and Associates, which is uh, represented here by uh, Gina Woolley, and you'll be hearing from her in a, for a minute. She in a minute. She's our owner representative for Proud Ground. She will be with with me every step of the way on the project, and she brings an extraordinary amount of experience in working in this community over 40 years of time in development. We're thrilled to have her on the team. Uh, Carlton Hart Architects is our lead architects, and with us tonight is uh, Michelle Black who's here, and Brendan Sanchez. They're here representing uh, Carlton Hart. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the work of this extraordinary architecture firm. And again, uh, happy to have them uh, on the team. LMC Construction, the general contractor for this project, representing uh, that uh, organization tonight is Ken Ballo. He's here, um, sitting in the back there. He's uh, with the LMC team. Um, the two of these uh, organizations work very closely together on many other projects, and they've also been on projects where the Housing Development Center, who has stepped in to help do our project management and our financing, um, and with us here tonight is Mary Bradshaw. She's here. Um, and having been one of the first executive directors of uh, the Portland Community Land Trust in the beginning comes with uh, that kind of experience, but also uh, they do this all day, every day, and we'll, we'll be relying on their expertise every step of the way. So uh, the collaborative uh, equity focus of this project is ab absolutely central. Sorry, if I can move th through here. Um, we're, we're working, again, Progrant and Habitat have been working uh, together as members of the AWE Collaborative, the African American Alliance for Home Ownership, and with that team to work with preference policy families. So this isn't just a building we're throwing up. This is designed to meet the needs of those families, and we're very proud of the work we've been doing with, with them. It's, we've come into the project having a good feel for who we're trying to serve. Um, just as a matter of history, uh, in the city of Portland, Prague Ground has about just, just slightly under 50% of the owners of Prague Ground homes are people of color, and that does not include children of, 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 of families uh, who bought homes, so it's quite a bit more than that, actually. Uh, at this point in time, 69% of, of the families on our wait list are people of color, and the median income uh, of our home buyers are at 63% of median income. This year, just this year, 76% of all home buyers uh, are people of color so far, and we have a very strong minority women emerging small business record. 100% uh, of the, uh, the contractors we work with are people of color. Uh, you've heard from Habitat already here tonight. Um, this, the focus they bring on the families at 35 to 60 percent of median income and the additional support and, and subsidy they bring is critical to the project and that gives us an opportunity to serve across the spectrum of uh, incomes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the AWE Collaborative has the experience of working with the preference policy families and, and are actively involved in North Northeast housing strategies and the implementation activities. So at this stage of the process, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Gina Woolley and let her take, uh, take you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Diane. Um, 
Did we got you on? Can you do my clicker? There you go. Thank you. Okay. And turn the other one off. So um, for this process, for this project, we will have a community engagement process. We, um, you know, in, through starting with the design of the project and moving all, all the way through the pre-development um, and into the actual construction. So we would hope to start with targeted outreach. The, um, the hope is here that we are going to be uh, this this project will be uh, will be housing for the second round of uh, preference families, and so the the key is to get out there and help stir the pot to to bring more families in and to talk about the pro this product coming online and to encourage people to work with community stakeholders to encourage people to um, if they're interested in this to um, you know put in their applications to get into the process. So we will be doing outreach to all, a, a number of community organizations um, that uh, may have individuals that are interested in moving back into the community um, that they serve. We, we know that many of these organizations right now serve families who have kids that are going to school, that they're living out in the numbers, but they've got children who are going to school here in Northeast schools. Um, so this is an opportunity to try to, uh, along with all the good work, all of our other partners, all the other partners are doing, all the other affordable housing partners and the Housing Bureau itself are doing, and the AWC Collaborative is doing to, you know, to make people aware of what these opportunities are. So we will, we will be looking to do, uh, you know, some direct outreach with uh, community organizations. We hope to, um, once we have, um, even if we're using people out of the first round, to actually, th this is a new concept. One of the things um, that came up, some of you may be aware of the Albina Vision process that uh, Rakaya Adams has been talking about, and one of the things that, that, she, that came up in her presentation that I saw recently is that you know when people come back here, they're not gonna be able to come back to the community that they left, which means they need to start thinking about other housing options, both in terms of renting and in terms of owning. Um, we don't have the land in this community left, and, and it's not priced at a level where you can, you can bring 5,000 families back into Northeast, and they're ex they all are gonna expect to be in a single family home. It isn't gonna happen. And so I think what we have to do is part of, with, with all the, the work that all of us are trying to do, is we have to start educating people that there may be other options and helping them to understand that those, it won't be the same as living in an apartment. Uh, a condo project has different construction standards that have to be met by code in terms of noise abatement, uh, all of that kind of stuff, uh, safety. So I think we need to start helping to educate community members that this is a, a very reasonable option, particularly if we're building family size units and that it, it, it's an, uh, an opportunity for them to own, to come back and own um, if, because we're not gonna have enough single families. If we look at the single family product that's been developed by our partners to date, it's, small numbers and it's probably, if we wanna bring large numbers of people back and we've got this preference policy, we're gonna to have to start thinking about having other tools in the toolkit. So uh, part of what we would wanna do is do these focus groups with, with prospective buyers, people who wanna come back and talk to them about what would be important for them, what kinds of things would be important for them to have if they weren't living in a single family house. If they were living in a condo unit, what would they want to have in that building? You know, what kind of a community would they want to be part of? Um, you know, so it's, a, it's partly helping to design an intentional community in those buildings, to put people together so that the, there are, um, that building is designed in a way to serve the families that we've identified that, wanna, that actually want to go into that. So these small focus groups would be, you know, we're looking to do some work 
there, and we're looking to do large focus groups with neighborhood stakeholders so they can provide feedback about the things that are important from them in terms of the, the, the building is an asset in the community. Um, attend neighborhood meetings, and we're also talking about doing an eco charrette so that we could actually identify the, the, the greening aspects of the building that would be important to the, to the people who would go into the building, who would live in the building. Um, oftentimes we as designers and builders and architects and developers make those decisions, but people may value certain things more than they value others, and we want to be able to, to incorporate that into the design process. Um, also a naming process. We don't have this project named. It's, we call it 5020 because that's the address, but ultimately I think having a naming process that the community um, participates in um, is another way to create a sense of ownership. So the, the community, and then regular updates to this committee as we're developing the project. Um, the community benefits that we expect to create um, are um, an, um, this interactive community visioning and planning of design process that I've just talked about. Um, the cross-cultural community outreach, that's all of the, the community engagement that I've just spoken about on the project development side. Of course, um, we've uh, proposed to have, um, uh, to target 35% MWESB and uh, have um, workforce hiring um, for uh, both women and men targets, 35% target for uh, minority workforce participation and 15% for women participation. Uh, LMC has done a very good job on projects that historically, if you look at their projects that they're building, um, they're achieving uh, these numbers and so we expect that we will be able to do that on this project. Um, the other thing is, is that this project is has long-term affordability. I was at your last meeting, I sat through the discussion about you know, people uh, not being able at some point having an, some, you know, the note come due and then basically having to, um, w when, the, when that subsidy runs out that they're basically having to refinance and that becomes a hardship. These units, because they're held, the land is held in a trust, um, become per permanent, they're permanently affordable. So these units will never, They'll, they'll remain. So the subsidy that goes into these units creates permanent affordable units that can be transferred from generation to generation. Uh, they can be sold to other people, but they are, will always remain affordable. Um, I want to talk just quickly about, um, we'll have, we may or may not have a first floor commercial. We, we will have to look at that in, through the, uh, the design and financial feasibility process. Um, we, uh, the, the subsidy that we're talking about is a one-time subsidy that creates this long-term uh, uh, affordability and also provides a leveraging for other public and, and private funds. And the, the other thing is, is that there is, uh, just as Steve talked about with their condo units, there is uh, post-purchase, there, there's pre-purchase counseling and there's post-purchase purchase counseling. So Proud Ground has a model where they work with their tenants after they're in their units to make sure that they successfully make that home ownership transition. And they've had a zero, a, a track record of zero foreclosures. So um, quickly on the timeline. So we don't have a uh, reservation letter yet. We were awarded exclusive rights to negotiate in the April NOFA. We are hoping to uh, be able to get that reservation letter soon because that will allow us to move forward with the, de the design development. Um, so until we do that, we're pretty much, we've been raising money for this project. Um, the, the subsidies, we actually have already raised $113,000 for this project without even having a reservation letter. So those are, that's funding that we will have to give back if we, you know, if for some reason we weren't given a reservation letter because it's specifically targeted at this project. Um, <clears throat> so we're hoping that we will, that we'll be able to get that reservation letter and then we kick into, uh, 
we would hope that we would get a, be able to negotiate our pre-development loan with PHB in, uh, by March uh, and then move into um, <clears throat> um, the pre-development, the more detailed design development, the plan, development of the plans, uh, the design review process, finalized construction documents, do permitting um, in 2018 and 2019 and be bidding this project uh, and uh, in 2019 with a finished date construction starting in April 2019. Can you move to the oh, second slide? And uh, basically have um, construction completed in April of 2020. So, Whenever the second round uh, applicants are ready, which we, we're, we are assuming will be sometime in 2019, I think Steve speci you know, had that in his timeline as well, um, or excuse me, 2018, but it may take, you may have 18 months that you're working with those families to get them ready to be able to purchase the home. Um, this timeline should line up very well with that timeline of when people will be ready to actually buy homes. So we would expect by the end of 2020, we would, we, we, we would be selling homes, um, you know, in 2020, but by the end of 2020, we would hope to have all of those homes sold. We're talking about 50 units. Um, the final, uh, the final is, is a list of uh, project features that we've identified that we would want to, you know, we would want to talk with through these. Uh, these are all things that we're, we've talked about including in the project, but also these are the kinds of things that would be sort of the baseline list that we would start talking with um, community members about in terms of what's important to them to design into the building. This, this, this project has not been designed. We, we haven't started design development on this project yet. So that's it. So just, here. just to wrap up, uh, for now, we're looking forward to your questions and we hope we've taken about the right amount of time. Um, we do wanna just emphasize that we have uh, very similar and strong outcomes uh, to what you just heard from Habitat in terms of the impact uh, to families kids doing better in school, employment uh, opportunities increasing, health outcomes better, and people are just more actively involved in their community when they're owners in a neighborhood. And um, we, as, as Gina mentioned, we didn't lose a single home through the entire recession because we worked towards success uh, for the long haul and we uh, really committed to allowing and supporting families thriving in these kinds of, in these kinds of units. So we're very uh, happy to hear your questions. Thank you. Questions from anyone? A question, it was mentioned in the prior, previous uh, presentation where there was funds uh, collected to take care of re re roof replacement, outside um, painting. Is this something in your plan as well to take care of those kind of upcoming expenses? Yes, this is, this is a standard classic condo uh, development and there will be HOA fees. And just know that the way we calculate affordability includes mortgage payments, HOA fees, and we've, we've calculated fairly high ones because they'll include that long-term maintenance and some ongoing uh, utility costs. Uh, instead of being a single family homeowner, they'll be in a condo, which means they're kind of in a forced savings environment for the long-term impacts to the building. And that, that will be set in stone going into the project in the beginning. Um, so it's all factored in and, you, and none of these families can spend more than 38% of their income on their total housing costs, including insurance. And of course, there'll be a 10 year abatement of property taxes on this project. And then when those 10 years are up, we work with them to get through that process going forward. Okay. So I think this is a great project. Um, it's all location, location, location. Um, 
it used to be on the site of Sunshine Cleaners. How do I know? Because I rolled to Sunshine Cleaners and it was closed and I was terribly disappointed. <laughs> then I went to PHB and someone told me that was the site of 5020 North Interstate. For those who aren't familiar, it's at the corner of um, where the MAX line is. So it's walkable to the MAX. It's near the Interstate Fire Station. Um, it is around the corner from Adidas. It's right near Overlook. It's right near the hospital. It's in a very prime location. So the questions that I have are more about the individual's ability to, to fit in into the neighborhood. Um, I know that Mississippi is right around the corner. I know that you know you have um, some large employers within close proximity. Um, and I want to know, first of all, have you engaged in conversations with those businesses and area residents? Because right now it looks pretty dilapidated. So I'm sure they're going to appreciate the transition of that space. Um, but I think the residents need to be, um, uh, I don't want to say integrated necessarily, but I welcomed back into that community um, as it's considerably changed and there's not much business that's dedicated towards them. So there's the possibility of a hyper segregation within um, that community. So that's my, my first question. Um, I think it's a great question, and I think part of building this um, community is to, to engage the local businesses and talk about the notion of this project coming online and, you know, um, how that kind of rapport can be built between the other stakeholders in the neighborhood. So talking with the neighborhood association, talking to local businesses, talking to the institutional players like the hospital. Are there, are there things that we can do to support these families and make them successful in this location? So I, I think it's a, um, a great thought and it's something that we can incorporate into our outreach and our community engagement process. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I would love to see the name reflective of the community. There are certain names that make you feel good. Matt Dishman. Look at Bishop. I said Matt Dishman. He starts smiling. <laughs> Matt Dishman. Community Center for those who are from North and Northeast Portland. So that would be great to see that. Um, additionally, uh, the land trust model is a very good model for individuals who are coming into first-time home ownership. I know that the type of housing is not the same as the individuals who have been displaced from these communities. So can we talk about not only um, how you've engaged, because I know you, you said you were going to mention it, I don't know if you started the engagement, but how you plan to engage not only with the type of housing that individuals be, that will be made available for individuals, but how you're going to engage um, the possibility of younger homeowners um, coming into this model and using this to build equity, and it could be their first move or their lifetime housing. Uh Again, we're going to, as Gina said, really work with the agencies in the whole area that have built, you know, institutions to serve African American community and make sure that they know to help people get into the preference policy process. You know that also well, Kip, because you were there, and, and including Jackie, who's in my office now, to really encourage people to apply so that they can get qualified to be able to consider one of these units. But I would also say that we're we're going to be. Uh, presenting very early in the process that these are condo units and they're family sized and they're uh, they are not single family homes but that we want to really meet people's expectations where they are and make sure that they know what they're applying for specifically and we've just picked up another single family home the fifth one and pre-purchased it uh, it's in it's in escrow right now so we will grab up as many single family homes as we can possibly and uh, get but five or even 10 or even 15 isn't enough to serve all these wonderful families. And so get, making sure they know that we are talking about condo opportunities is gonna be part of the process from the very beginning. You wanna add something? Thank you very much. We're kind of pressed on time. If there are any specific questions with, okay. I'm excited about the fact that uh, the work is going forward. One of the things we were concerned about is how rapidly we can start moving things forward, getting some um, shovels in the ground and some nails and some boards. So I'm excited about that. And as you go forward, that we'll continue this conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward thank to what's in front. Appreciate your time. Our next group, Travis Phillips and the PCRI.
Welcome. Thank you. Good evening to a small group of uh, oversight <laughs> committee members this evening, but happy to share some updates with you uh, about what we've going, got going on for uh, PCRI's development uh, in the works for the site at the corner of Northeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and Rosa Parks Way, um, which we are calling the King Parks Apartments. Um, as uh, Bishop Holt mentioned, I'm Travis Phillips, the Director of Housing Development for Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives, or PCRI. We are the um, project sponsor uh, and will be the eventual owner of this development. <clears throat> and. Um, just a little bit, and I'm gonna kind of hustle through, but I'm happy to answer any questions or, or uh, flag me if you want me to slow down a little bit here. But um, um, So our development team for the project consists of us, uh, our architect, uh, uh, the women-owned Merriman Barnes architects, and uh, Colas Construction as our general contractor, uh, who's also working on our current project, uh, the Beatrice Morrow. Uh, project uh, just up uh, MLK uh, Boulevard here that is currently under construction. And to give you a little bit of an idea about uh, where we are at now and sort of how we've uh, worked through the process to get where we're at right now, um, <clears throat> quick timeline just from January of 2016 when the original notice of funding of, uh, availability uh, application we submitted. Um, uh, initial awards were announced in April of that year. We were awarded the development opportunity for that site in uh, May of last year, and then were requested by the Bureau to apply for 9% low-income housing tax credit financing for uh, that development as one of the sources of funding. Um, that application was submitted in September of last year. Um, Oregon Housing and Community Services, who makes those funds available or those awards available, um, announced awards in November. Uh, ours was uh, the one of two projects from Portland uh, that were submitted and was not the one of the two projects that were awarded at that point in time. Uh, but we did subsequently get a funding award in April of this year. Um, a lot of crazy stuff happened with tax credit pricing with the Trump administration coming into place, and so there was some negotiation about the assumptions that we made uh, when we submitted for our application in September and where things were at uh, come April of this year. Um, in that time, we've gotten some additional uh, tax credit equity um, to help close some gaps on the project. Uh, we've also continued to work through our design development and submit for our public works permitting earlier this year. Uh, and I'm happy to report that we, uh, I believe, have closed all of the final financing gaps on our project. Uh, just this week, we're working through a couple of the um, fussy details of uh, fees and interest rates with our financing partners to make sure that we've got everything uh, well nailed down. Um, but I'm happy to report that I believe we're ready to move forward and hopefully begin construction great news. Uh, in spring. That's yes, great news. I agree. Yeah, well I am done. also very, very happy about yeah, that. That's great news. <clears throat> um, this is all. This is all in your packet. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but just to report that we've got a pretty broad mix of incomes uh, with project-based Section 8 vouchers committed to the project to serve uh, households at or below 30% uh, of household income, uh, and then a mix of units going up to 60%. It'll be a 100% affordable project with a total of 70 units spread across one, two, and three bedroom uh, unit sizes. Definitely thought about amenity. Oh, amenities. Uh, got ahead of myself there in my <laughs> in my paperwork, but definitely thought about amenities and what's really needed uh, for families here. Uh, had a lot of conversations with neighbors and neighborhood and uh, PCRI's existing residents, but knowing that along MLK, it's really important to have some play space uh, for families there. And there's an open and secured courtyard that's framed by the wings of the building. Um, we've got a large community room there for resident programming to help with all sorts of stuff from after school programming to financial education to the host of other programs that PCRI provides. Uh, laundry on every floor of the building and uh, it is just down the street from PCRI's offices 
uh, where we can provide additional services to residents. <clears throat> Talking through a little bit of what we've done with community engagement so far, obviously uh, we've been here in front of the Oversight Committee a number of times sharing information with you, um, but have done quite a bit with the Neighborhood Association as well, who's been very interested in what's going on with the project. Um, who uh, has some grant funds available for Rosa Parks, uh, a Rosa Parks uh, artwork project that were really, uh, they were very excited about the opportunity to perhaps include that with this development. Um, and I'm happy to report that Dr. Bates has uh, uh, helped us uh, connect with an artist who I think might be a fantastic um, addition to the project team and, and really help us do something special. Uh, to to um, celebrate Rosa Parks uh, as was intended with a, a grant that the neighborhood associations had for quite some time and hasn't had the opportunity to do anything with. Um, we've also had a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, personal conversations, phone conversations, uh, additional communication with the neighbors who are right near the property. Um, some of whom are very excited about uh, things coming in, some of whom uh, want a lot of different things that are hard to accomplish in one project, but I think we've had a, a, some really productive conversations with them to help them understand um, the uh, parameters and, and the, the constraints that we've got and actually help them feel uh, definitely listened to and uh, and in some cases, there were some concerns that they, that they had uh, in terms of the building shadowing their yard or uh, safety or security that uh, we've really uh, walked through uh, a lot of detail with them to help them feel comfortable that those really aren't concerns that they need to, that, that are gonna be um, valid. <laughs> uh, the concerns are valid, but they're, they're ones that we've uh, considered and, and won't be of concern uh, once the building's built. Um, and then uh, just a few um, upcoming checkpoints. Um, community design standard, we're pursuing community design standards uh, for the development, so there's no design review process. Um, we're using uh, prescriptive uh, design elements uh, to streamline that. Um, we anticipate our 60% submission uh, for our public works permits, uh, which is a technical way of saying a lot of the street and transit and other connectivity um, gets reviewed separately from the building permit, so we're working well through that. Anticipate submitting for our building permit uh, in December as well. Um, and um, when I put together the presentation, uh, I anticipated finalizing the details of our finance structure this month, and, uh, and there we are. Uh, and let's see here, I'm not doing a very good job of following my pages, but uh, so construction financing timeline. So once we get that nailed down, um, closing financing in March or April of next year with construction start happening immediately after that. Uh, we're projecting a construction period of 14 months, uh, which puts us for completion right around August of 2019, uh, which is when folks will start moving in. So. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Uh, questions? Committee. I'm still interested in looking at the safety. Um, I'm also concerned because most of the residents have lived in single dwelling units before, and this applies to all that have done presentations, is do you have a system in place where alarms are in the units for each unit. I know we talked about the um, fire alarm, but I'm concerned about uh, services. Uh, most of you are fairly close to your properties that you're servicing your clients. And my concern is what are your hours? Are you like a 24 hour service? Is it just business hours, eight to five or? Those sure. kind of things. Sure. L let me actually clarify a couple of things. So unlike the prior presentations, the King Parks apartments here are intended as a uh, rental development, yes. so not for home ownership. Um, with that and with uh, multifamily building code, um, 
you know, definitely fire and smoke alarms in all of the units. It's the building has fire sprinklers built in. Um, part of that public works permitting process is ensuring that emergency services can access the building safely and efficiently um, and sort of thinking through all of those safety concerns. Mm -hmm. um, all the units are sort of inwardly focused uh, into the courtyard or through the corridors uh, in the building. So uh, kind of uh, thinking through safety in terms of, you know, we know we've got a couple of busy streets there and we wanna make sure that the activity on the site isn't focused toward those busy streets. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, in terms of management and maintenance of the building, um, you know, the, we imagine that the uh, rental and management office will be more or less an eight to five um, time frame, but there will be an on-site manager uh, and we, we do have after hours maintenance for any emergency concerns that happen there too. So there will be somebody uh, pretty readily available at any point in time. Thank you. So I don't know if anyone else noticed that, but he said King and Park. I was like, this building has to be the epitome of social and racial justice. <laughs> it's at the corner of King. Okay, never mind. Hope so. so yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'm putting. I'm just putting that out there. Um, so glad to see that you cleared up the funding gap. That was going to be one of my first con uh, questions, and then it was going to be in regards to construction. So that's good. Um, I noticed on the project unit mix something that I appreciate. Um, so you have at the both one bedroom and two bedroom deeply affordable 30 percent project-based vouchers, but also um, non-voucher-based units that are going to be available. So I think that's a huge point to bring up. So that's going to be individuals um, who are going to be able to access that at a deeply affordable level. Um, one of the asks that I'm going to have, and I'm, I'm going to be mentioning this all night, is right around the corner is DECOM, and DECOM is starting to explode also. You're going to start seeing the development of businesses right there around that corner. My ask is that you, as, as you all continue to develop this, you go to those businesses and let them know that there will be individuals who are going to be over there. And if there's any economic opportunities as the development of those opportunities happen prior to it completely gentrifying, that they notify the individuals that, that's, that those opportunities exist because we're seeing it right now. And for those of you who don't know, roll down DECOM and it's, it's kind of the precursor to the boom um, you have Woodlawn Park right there, and then you have um, Stephen Green's place right there, but then you're seeing a lot of different um, uh, cafes and breakfast spots and beer places open up. So um, as that continues to develop, it would, I would love to see individuals who are going to be living there having those same economic opportunities extended to them. I, if, if possible. Yep. I know that's not what you yep. all do, but that's an ask. You know, I mean, it, I mean, it isn't our core focus, Cupid, but I definitely appreciate that, and um, and it is some of what we do. Uh, we have had some of those conversations already with businesses along MLK, uh, not so much along Decom, uh, though I think there's definitely opportunity there, uh, and I appreciate, and I think we'll definitely follow up on that suggestion. Uh, one of the businesses that we have had some conversations with is the Oregon Public House, I know you mentioned Stephen Green. Uh, I'll throw in a selfless plug for a happy hour uh, benefiting PCRI there next Tuesday evening, which we'll have some great entertainment for, so. <laughs> no Dr. Bates? Um, just a specific, a note specific to this um, project, and then I have a more general comment about all the projects sort of together um, one of in part of this conversation about the public art um, it was brought to my attention from the neighborhood association that there may be a plan to cut down the sidewalk a bump out at MLK and Rosa Parks which appears to be obvious concern for pedestrian safety particularly given the residents of this building not only this building but other buildings nearby um, and I would just encourage not only PCRI, but PHB to contact the equity manager at PBOT, Zan Gibbs, and um, begin a conversation about whether that is actually an appropriate uh, engineering and choice given concerns for Vision Zero, pedestrian safety, but particularly for equity um, given the other uh, buildings and uses, including elementary school on that corner. Um, seems very obvious to me that that's not an 
that is not an equity move, um, and I think some bureau to bureau communication or perhaps commissioner to commissioner conversation may be useful um, in that regard. It would be a serious, pretty serious safety concern given truck traffic there. Um, my sort of bigger picture question I, or comment, I think, is um, you know, I, I hope that as neighborhoods are urbanizing more, which we're seeing, you know, because of the zoning and comp plan throughout the city, that there will be, you know, less of a stigma to the multifamily housing as being, you know, affordable housing, that there's a wide range of income folks who are living in multifamily dwellings and attached units and et cetera, et cetera. But I do take seriously the question not only about how one communicates to families who may have a vision in their mind of, you know, moving back to Northeast Portland means moving into a bungalow or moving into the kind of house that I grew up in and these are the options, but also in that there is still a class bifurcation about who owns homes that are single family homes in Northeast Portland and who will be living in these kinds of buildings. Um, and I think that's already visible in neighborhoods and communities around here that it's sort of like those people live in that kind of building. Um, and so I'm just wondering about the need for broader community development, not only connecting folks into jobs, but also sort of, you know, helping to insist, for example, that, you know, neighborhood associations do outreach into the multifamily communities and ensure that they're connecting and community engagement and basic civic participation. Um, ensuring that the parks and other public spaces are fully welcoming, that there is not, you know, over policing attention, et cetera, et cetera, as these buildings co are coming online so that people can really truly feel welcome um, and not feel stigmatized by the kind of building that they're living in. Thank you, Dr. Bates. Uh, I have no questions. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations Thank on you. that funding piece. That's a big deal. Yeah, put our hands together on that. Excellent. Well, um, next on our agenda is the ADU program presentation. And I'm going to have you guys come on up to present. But here's our caveat. Without a quorum, we cannot make a determination tonight. Um, and so this is more informational than it will be decision-based. So uh, with that approach, it's great to hear and be aware of where we've come. I think the majority of us read the information already. So um, I'll let you walk us through it. But again, without a quorum tonight, we cannot make a decision. So I'll have to determine how we best go about that. In light of that, Ira and Andrew. Um, so what I'll do is kind of a brief review of the ADU program as, as was presented about two meetings ago, um, and then point out some of the uh, clarification of questions that came up um, at that meeting. So the accessory dwelling unit is a program that was um, brought together. It was designed um, and to come up with between Portland Housing Bureau and Prosper Portland. And the goal is home ownership retention of longtime residents who have lived in the interstate corridor urban renewal area but are still at risk of displacement due to the high cost of home ownership, maintenance, um, the inability or lack of ability of aging in place. So this would kind of address all of those options. Um, the accessory dwelling units that we plan to finance and, and help uh, the homeowners build can be used for various reasons. They can rent it out at market rent. So one of the things we note is that the ADU is going to be financed by a loan that's going to require payments. Um, constructing an accessory dwelling unit in a home will raise property taxes. So um, this is something that will have an increase in cost. So one of the things that we don't want to do is reduce how much revenue that the accessory dwelling unit can bring in, uh, mandating that, and then and thus causing um, a greater hardship on that household. So we're not going to regulate those rents. Um, but a homeowner may be fine with 
being able to cover that and may need something more personal. Maybe they want to bring family members in or maybe they need a live-in care provider to support them as they age. Or perhaps they themselves want to age in place but don't need as much space as the primary home so they can downsize and then rent out the larger structure for um, even greater revenue. The one thing that we are um, aware of is the rise in short-term rental uh, properties. And so that is the one thing, at least for the duration of the term of the loan, which is 15 years, the accessory dwelling units cannot be used as short-term rentals. And the homeowner can't work, kind of work that system, move into the ADU themselves, and then use the primary structure as short-term rental. Um, again, it is uh, a max loan of $80,000 for the accessory dwelling unit. It is 0% interest. Um, there will be 180 equal payments over that time. Um, we don't want to penalize families who may have to leave and so they transfer the home to another family member. So the loan can be assumed by a family member, same terms, or the remainder of the term. It won't start over. It will be secured by a second lien on the home. And we do know and recognize that um, the homes themselves may require some additional support or additional maintenance. And so we're going to provide up to $15,000 for home repair from our current home repair program. Um, there won't be payments on that additional, on those additional dollars. And those dollars will be forgiven after 15 years. The loan qualifications is if there's an existing mortgage, they have to be current on that. Um, they do have to have a loan that will allow for a second. Some loans uh, may be out there where the banks will decline that. So that's one of the things that we will investigate. Um, they have to be current on their property taxes or in a current tax deferment program. They have to have enough home equity to secure the loan amounts. Um, we're going to allow a debt to income ratio up to 60%. So, um, and that's not including the increased rent. So we want to, we know that people are going to be on fixed incomes, especially if they're older individuals. Um, so we're going to be a lot more flexible than a traditional lending institution is on that. And we are not going to allow reverse mortgages. And the main reason for that is a reverse mortgage basically works against the homeowner by eating up their equity. So this would be reserving equity that would essentially be lost by the homeowner. So we're not going to allow for those either. Um, eligible applications, they're going to be a current homeowner. They are going to be um, at an income of under 120% area median income. Um, they will have to have purchased their home prior to the establishment of the urban renewal area, which is uh, August of 2000, or they could be a family member that purchased that home uh, from someone who owned it prior to the 2000 establishment. Um, the homes themselves will, will for the pilot program, and I, I do want to stress that to be clear, this is a pilot program. Um, the homes will be located in the interstate corridor. They are going to be single family detached owner occupied homes. Um, we are looking at homes with a basement with a minimum of 500 square feet. Um, the primary unit we hope is in a safe and habitable condition. But again, we recognize that may not be the case. And so we want to be able to bring up uh, those homes to that standard within those funds. Um, and so one question that was brought up last uh, last time was why only basements when there's a plethora of um, accessory dwelling unit options or ADU, ADU options that are out there. Um, one, basement ADUs are the lowest cost overall on average. Um, it allows us to, pro to focus the program um, because this is a pilot. We can expand it later if, if those options work out. Um, it helps us develop efficiencies in the processes. Um, that would include like the homeowner education for landlord support, understanding and being able to specifically see value to um, tax increase on those basements. Um, and then again, it allows us for expansion. So it's better to start off small and then grow the program rather than have all the options available and then find out that we're just not being efficient, it's not working out, it's too costly, and then have to constrict um, or contract those options. Um, one visual I put in the PowerPoint is kind of a star with the different bubbles. Each bubble would represent five different things that we'd have to figure out. So if you can imagine each of those bubbles going five different ways, it would 
easily turn into kind of a graphic mess as well as a policy and design mess. Um, so the program requirements, we are going to require landlord education. Um, that will be provided either by Portland Housing Bureau, um, Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, or BDS. They all have uh, landlord education, but the most important thing is that we are going to provide that to the homeowner. Um, they have to register as a business with the city of Portland, and then they have to sign up or sign an agreement for the loan terms and the program restrictions. So um, prior to just doling out the dollars and starting the whole thing, when we select the applicants, um, I will, if, if no one else, I will sit down, talk with them personally and say, these are the costs of the ADU. This is what the requirements are going to be. These are some of the things you have to be aware of. Um, and then that agreement also will help us see what their intent is. So if their intent is for family, we will be able to know that and be able to track that. If it's for renters, then we can support that option as well. And then the supportive services. So as I mentioned just a second ago, there's gonna be a budget and program review um, to make sure they're, again, aware of what the responsibilities and requirements of the program are. Um, we're gonna have a property inspection and an assessment to make sure the house is um, able to have an ADU built in it. Um, one of the concerns that was brought up is what if the homeowner needs more than $15,000 in home repair? So if that is the case, we do have a home repair program that we can switch them over. So perhaps the ADU program is not the best option for them. The home repair option gives up to $40,000 for home repair. So that is something that we would transition them to. Um, there is an income tax education. So we currently are, um, we have an arrangement with an accountant to provide uh, tax education for our mortgage credit certificate, home, uh, homeowners who use that program. So uh, I've talked with him, he is aware and is in agreement and okay with supporting our ADU homeowners as well with the tax implications of that. Um, we have Metro Home Shares I mentioned before, and then various community partners. So I've talked to all of the community partners that are here um, this evening, as well as uh, Urban League, SEI, um, because we'll also be using them kind of as a marketing stream to get applicants to sign up for the program. Um, and then again, with outreach, we're gonna do a mass mailing. We're gonna do a specific mailing to homes that we've already targeted. Um, we have word of mouth that's already coming in. Um, we have homeowners who have signed up for the home repair program where the ADU program might be a better option or a better fit for them. So we have kind of that referral process as well. And then again, we're gonna communicate with our community partners um, who have any kind of relationship with homeowners um, that exist right now. So are there any other questions? Thanks, Ira. <clears throat> so I, I do have the same questions that I had before, and there are some pretty serious questions um, around the idea of sequencing additionally. So everyone walk with me. Currently, there's mandatory relocation assistance coming online, and it's kind of being changed. This would be individuals becoming landlords, knowing that mandatory relo is something that could include ADUs if they get rid of the one unit exemption, meaning that some individuals who would be becoming landlords might be obligated to pay individuals if they somehow mess up and they, and they haven't been, been landlords before. So for me, stronger, stronger resources for these individuals helping them create a lease, do all these other things would be super important for me because knowing that those things are coming down the line could cause someone who initially used this to keep their house ending up having to take out additional loans and possibly losing their house. I, and, and I know that's it's not as far-fetched, but, and, and, but it's kind of extreme. But knowing that all of this is going on in the same office, I'm assuming that you've already identified that and maybe you just didn't bring that up. But I know that um, I would want to see what's going on with mandatory relo because that would be something that these individuals could be subject to um, and would be a considerable burden if for some reason they were having someone in their house that they just didn't get along with that was renting an ADU in their basement and they gave them a no cause eviction, which 
that triggers the mandatory reload, which could be between $2,000 and $4,000 that they would have to pay those individuals, and they might not even know that. So making sure that that's, you know, this, this type of assistance is given to them to train them on how to be a landlord over the course, not just at the beginning, but over the course of time would be highly important. Um, the second thing was, um, I noticed, uh, I, I thought you brought up a good point about um, the, uh, the landlord maybe moving into the ADU. I'm sure you're going to go ahead and there's going to be consistent auditing of this program. Uh, thank you, Cupid, for bringing up the mandatory relocation implications. So we have been tracking the status of the exemption for the single unit. Um, and so that has been on our minds, clearly. Um, and then I think to the second point, um, I mean, I think the Housing Bureau is very keenly tracking all of the different components of the program that have the potential, whether it's far-fetched or not, um, to make vulnerable homeowners even more precariously housed in the homes that they already own. And so um, we are tracking uh, all of those implications very carefully and documenting all of the technical experts that we are consulting around property tax implications, um, income tax implications at both the state and the federal level. Um, and admittedly, all of those details are not in this PowerPoint presentation at this point. Um, but we do appreciate you keeping those kind of at the forefront of the conversation. I think it would be hard for anyone to make a, a vote on anything without having those crucial pieces of information concerning individuals in this community, especially around mandatory reload. Like I would want to see what the possible solutions would be knowing that that's not something that has been finalized yet. I don't believe until December the 14th, mm -hmm. but um, I know that you would have people who would be voting on that like now. Is it question time? It is question time. Great. So I have a comment and a question. Uh, my, my comment, I just want to put a pin in this issue around landlord education. I have seen the manual that is used by the city of Portland in its landlord training, and I would call it problematic at best in terms of its adherence probably to the strict letter of the law in terms of fair housing with regard to tenant screening and treatment, but certainly not to a larger spirit of justice and equity and access to housing. So I would really put some question marks around um, utilizing or, or sort of wanting to move forward with some additional training, particularly in light of additional tenant protections um, that exist not only relocation, but generally around leasing versus month to month, et cetera, that there needs to be um, a continual updating and sort of a refresh of that. Um, I think our work, we've tried to be you know, guided by concepts of equity broadly defined, not just in the, in the very stringent letter of the law, and it would be um, a shame to continue to propagate um, some of the really, frankly, very problematic things that are in that landlord training. Um, my question is about the, you know, this is being described as a pilot. So when I think of a pilot, I imagine that there's an evaluation plan, some sort of success metrics, and then some notion about whether or not it's expanded either to more people, right, that gets more money, or to the other, you know, circles on the points of the star. So what does that look like? And is that also imagined to happen within the time frame of the Igura TIF um, expenditures? I think currently in terms of the pilot, and I think this also gets to Cupid's question about auditing also, uh, the program has proposed um, annual check-ins, annual surveying of the program participants um, from a both quantitative and qualitative lens to check in with them about how the program is being utilized by their household, and also to see, uh, both from a technical perspective, are you renting it, is it a family member, is it a caregiver, are you charging rent, how much, have you had conflicts, 
those types of questions, but also um, do you feel supported as a landlord? Do you feel confident in your ability to make changes to the landlord-tenant relationship if you need to? Um, all, all of those kinds of questions to make sure that our intentions to stabilize the homeowners are having the intended outcome um, from a variety of different perspectives. So I think that's my first response around evaluation is just making sure that the proposed outcome for stabilizing the homeowners is the, um, the outcome that we're actually seeing. And so currently for our home repair and home retention programs, the outcome data evaluation that we do is looking annually to see if the assisted homeowners are still in their homes and looking to see if we can tell did they um, sell the home? Were they foreclosed on? Some of them are no longer living there, but they're renting the home. And so we would do a similar evaluation of this pilot. Um, you know, I think we're also needing to make sure that we have an adequate understanding of how the accessory dwelling unit permit and development process is going to work for this program. Uh, and so, you know, from a programmatic perspective, we just need to make sure that that's both efficient and effective um, before we would propose any kind of expansion. I wouldn't imagine we would propose an expansion of the pilot in the first three years unless really pushed to do so by elected officials, community advocates um, for some really strong reasons. And do you have a way to think about whether or not other forms of ADUs would be possible in an expansion? I would like to think that they are. I mean, I think as Ira mentioned, you know, this is um, new work for the Bureau. There was a, an accessory dwelling unit conference last Friday that I attended, and there was very little discussion of accessory dwelling units that were being developed by government entities with public funding for very vulnerable homeowners. Um, and so I think you know there's some places, some resources that we have to draw on, but we have a lot of lessons to learn in the pilot and hopefully we're, we're able to learn those um, quickly and with not a lot of painful lessons. But I, I like to think that those are really along the development timeline kinds of things and not how is this going to work for the homeowners, but I think we'll be learning some of those lessons too. Okay, so are you talking about three years post ADU completion and lease up, or are you talking about three years from entry to the program? That would be the evaluation period. Oh, I was talking about three years from the start of the pilot. So also kind of tracking how did the outreach work? You know, who did we reach out to? What did those strategies look like? How do we evaluate their effectiveness? Who moves forward? Sure, into but those enrollment? aren't, sure. I'm sorry, oh. I'm just trying to be mindful of time. Those aren't uh, housing stabilization outcomes. So you would have actually like a much shorter amount of housing stabilization outcomes um, given the time that it would take to construct, et cetera. I don't have a problem with that. I just want to make a note that's not three years of housing stability. No, probably two years. Probably two years. That you would be evaluating. Let's see how long it takes for people to actually construct and lease up. Um, so I'm just trying to understand like what will be the potential expansion of this if there would you know let's say this is a smashing success, um, you know what would what will then what? It's 2021 like. Is there money? Is there? Is this still going to be coming up within the framework of ICURA TIF expenditures? Is this something that is now an awesome okay. priority of PHB that like is the thing that we want to keep doing, or is this just kind of like a 
a little trial balloon. Well, so the proposal for the ADU program was actually the suggestion of the Prosper Portland North Northeast um, Community Development Initiative. So I think you know some of the community conversations that they had highlighted this. Uh, so, you know, they then reached out to the Bureau. We said, yes, we'd heard some of this too. Why don't we try to see if we can launch this in partnership? So the resources that are budgeted for this are 40 ADUs over a five-year period. Uh, and so, you know, in the first, you know, I think we are looking at, you know, eight units annually for five years. So. Uh, you know, I think we can always accelerate that timeline if we're able to make sure that the, you know, the program is moving forward with its due diligence. Um, and we don't want to put any homeowners at risk. And if we can move those ADUs, you know, in, ter in terms of the development timeline. Um, so I think the resources will be there. I think we're also hearing about ADUs as a much needed strategy to stabilize homeowners in the Southwest Corridor. So that's another option in terms of just potential long-term vision of accessory dwelling units to stabilize homeowners. Okay, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, you know, how much attention do I want to pay to this relative to other things that are sort of of larger impact and whether it's, it's something that is seen as like a major new avenue of work. Um, but I also just would make the note because I, I keep hearing this this notion of like stabilizing the most vulnerable homeowners that these are not probably the most vulnerable homeowners because they have to qualify, right? They have to be current on their mortgage payments. They have to be have home equity. So there, there's another category of people that I would actually describe as most vulnerable um, that is not this group. I still think this is very important, and I still you know see this as. I think this is a very useful and interesting way to think about making ADU something more than like a fun Airbnb toy um, for people who have lots of money. But I don't think it's quite the same thing as preserving home ownership for the most vulnerable people who are probably already not going to qualify for this program. Thank you. Um, I have a question on program requirements. And for the city of Portland, it defines this type of uh, unit as a business. And yet, uh, for federal tax law, state income tax law, it is not a business. So how and why are we treating this like a business is my question, as opposed to a rental situation. Or maybe it's not a rental, depending on what they're doing. If it's a family member, it may not be producing income. It's, it's my current understanding, um, based on conversations with the um, Bureau of, City Bureau of Revenue, that when you're operating as a landlord and you have a lease and you're renting a unit, um, even if it's one in your home, that you still do need to simply register as a business. There used to be an exception for number of units and types of units, and that um, exemption was eliminated five years or so ago, and so um, I could be incorrect in that understanding, and that could change in the future. But they do need, at this point in time, we are assuming that they need to register as a landlord with the, uh, with the city. Okay, it's a, with, registering as a business. As a business. Uh, um, yes, I understand registering with the city, but not necessarily as a business. That's my concern. It, it, my understanding is that it is as a business. For, for the city it's a, rules. It's a business license, right, to rent a unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing us up to speed on what's going on. Again, since we don't have a quorum, we're not in a position to vote. However, with what's been identified, we've still got a couple of those elements, I think, that we need to settle. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate your presentation. And we will move forward with our next item, which happens to be you, Andrea. Homeownership updates. All right, thank you. Uh, I do want to make one clarification before I get started. Um, in the packets that were uh, right inside the doorway, um, the 
chart that you have is different than what was emailed to you. There was a typo in the version that you got in your email. And so um, the one in your email, I think, referenced uh, a dollar amount for the 5020 condo project that uh, program presented earlier is half a million dollars. It's actually five million dollars, so a rather significant typo. So I just want to make sure that we're all talking from the same numbers. Yes, big difference. Uh, so I wanted to provide a brief update uh, as a follow-up to the last Oversight Committee meeting that we had where we presented a proposed increase in homeownership subsidies on a per-unit basis from $80,000 to $100,000 for down payment assistance and then from $80,000 to $125,000 per unit for the development of permanently affordable new construction units that uh, was voted on by the Oversight Committee and then taken to the mayor um, earlier uh, last week, excuse me. Um, he did approve that, and so um, the Bureau has formalized that increase at this point in time. And so in the chart that was um, emailed to you and is in your packets and on the screen, those numbers reflect that subsidy increase per year unit. Also in the conversation with the mayor's office last week around increasing the subsidy, we were very clear that to maintain service to the original 65 households proposed in the North Northeast Neighborhood Housing Strategy back in 2015, increasing that subsidy would reduce that number of 65 households unless the mayor's office supported additional resources to homeownership. And so additional resources were supported by the mayor's office to the tune of $2 million. And so the $5 million allocated back in 2015 is now $7 million. And that increase will maintain, uh, at least we believe very concretely at this time, homeownership opportunities for 65 households. Um, so that's summarized in the first two paragraphs of the um, update memo that you were emailed. Uh, so kind of moving on in that memo, uh, let's see, you heard earlier from Habitat for Humanity um, on their um, condo project, 12 units on Olin. Uh, at this point in time, the Housing Bureau has been in conversations with Habitat around the timeline of that, process, of that project. And uh, we believe at this point that that project is on a shorter timeline than some of the other projects that Habitat, as part of the AWE Collaborative, had been considering for their share of the $5 million. They were awarded resources for that project in the winter NOFA uh, TIF lift resources, but because the timelines for the development of that are shorter than some of the other ones, the conversations that the Bureau and Habitat have been having are around moving it from the TIF lift resources awarded in the winter NOFA to the um, North Northeast TIF resources that are being used to serve those 65 households. So they would decline the NOFA dollars, and they would use the original resources awarded to the AW Collaborative because we've got households in the queue now that could benefit from those shorter development timelines. So I want to pause there and see if there's any questions about that. OK. So, I think we're pondering. Okay. We're processing. Okay. I think we're processing. So part part of that pondering is also, um, and I'm going to kind of refer us now to that matrix, that chart, um, that color coded chart that's on the screen. Um, can I ask if are you folks all looking at just black and white copies? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, 
So the color coding on that chart, and I'd like to get that out to you uh, electronically with the accurate numbers at some point so you have it, is color coded in a way that's intended to convey the three different kinds of interstate TIF that's been allocated for home ownership. So you can see the projects, and then you can also see the different kinds of TIF that's been awarded to the projects. And the folks in the audience, I apologize that uh, you're looking at a black and white version. I'm gonna try and use the names of the projects instead of just referring to the colors um, so that you can follow along with me in the audience. So the original five million, for the folks who can probably not see that, it's the blue, it's the PCRI townhomes, the proud ground acquisition rehab for 320,000, and then we are proposing that the Olin project be moved to the original $5 million pot of resources, 1.5 million for the, the AH Collaborative Olin project. And then we've got two, um, two other projects in there, down payment assistance for 700,000 and a partnership with a private developer to do um, townhomes for 750,000. So those projects would comprise the original $5 million allocated to the AW Collaborative. Yes. Can you say in a very simple way what the material purpose, like what is the difference or why do I care? I understand this, but is there something that I need to know here or like is this just informational or like what, it's TIFF, it's TIFF, it's TIFF, like I'm having a hard time understanding what I'm supposed to be thinking about. So can I, oh, go ahead. so a part of the issue um, you're right, it is TIFF is TIFF is TIFF, but part of the issue is around the initial 65 people and the dollars that were allocated for those 65 versus us running the preference policy again for subse subsequent home ownership opportunities. And so that's why even though it doesn't make any difference to you if you're buying a house, it makes a difference to us because of fair housing we have to offer when we offer what we're offering. And so that's part of the reason why we are trying to distinguish between pots of money, which developments go into which pots and which groups of preference policy folks get with, go to with which projects. So I think that's my question is then, like, which groups of preference policy go with which of these pots of money? Because the pots of money is not the point, as I understand it. Right. The point is, is this a round one of preference policy or is this a new round of preference policy? So is that actually divided by these pots of money or is that divided by the time frame in which these are coming online? So yes and. So the blue, as I understand it, what would be blue, or if you could see it up on the- The north, um, northeast stuff. Right, so the blue and then the additional dollars that just that we just got approved to increase the subsidy or for Those the first round. Those are TIF money. Right. The additional $2 million is also TIF money. Correct. Great. So that's for the first round. Great. And, so, and are we pointing out, and I, I think this might answer some of the questions, that the overall amount of units that were to be produced with all of these dollars is less? Yes, that's correct. It is, yeah, it is less. Less than what? So if we, if we, so based on our overall TIF dollars that have been um, set aside for home ownership, mm -hmm. If we had not increased the subsidy, it would have been around 250 or so homes. But with the increase in the subsidy, the overall over the next five years, it's gonna be about 204, 205, somewhere around in there. So we're gonna lose about 40 some odd homes by the increase in the subsidy. So overall it's less, but out of the initial allocation, it will be the same, we will, house 65 people because that's what we said we were going to do. 
Because the original, the additional two million dollars is not new money. It's just moving money from some like later point in the home yes. ownership pool. Exactly. Great. So I'm still back to this question of like, what is it that I'm? I I don't need this to be walked through in explaining to me what is red, blue, and green. Okay. What I'm asking for is tell me what it is that I'm actually paying attention to here with regard to why I, why, why do I care? So she hadn't gotten to that part yet. And so there's a, there's a question. <laughs> so there's a question around moving uh, both Olin, moving the Olin project and then funding part of another project out of dollars and whether or not the oversight committee is okay with us doing that, whether we need to do a process. And so that's part of the discussion and what was in the, in the memo. So I'm hoping I'm clarifying more than confusing. So I think long story short, the Bureau is wanting the Oversight Committee to have as clear an understanding as possible about where the, what projects will be available to the original 65 households who the provider is, where they're located, all of those things. And as we try to be as clear about that as possible, we are also wanting to get your, get you clarity about what other projects are in the queue and make sure that we are operating as transparently as possible about how they got there. How much money, what kind of money, do they need a new preference policy round? So that's what this conversation is about. So that's what the color coding is about and all of the detail. Um, I can walk you through it. I cannot walk you through it. Lisa's shaking her head. But I think that there's a very important question in tonight's conversation, which is one of these projects came to us as a package and the housing Kilpatrick, 30 units, Habitat got a discount on the land if they bundled the units into 30. The Housing Bureau said, it's our preference that you not bundle 30 units on the same site for the original 65 households. We'd prefer that you take 12 of those units and offer them to the current preference policy households, those 65, and then you take the, the remaining 18 units and you fund them in the future for a, a different pot of money from this, a different preference policy round so that you can talk specifically in your marketing materials about those units. So that's, how this information is portrayed in front of you. But the hitch is that there has not been a process by which the Bureau can allocate those resources to the second phase of this project for Habitat. We think it's a good idea because of the cost, the efficiencies, economies of scale, what have you, and kind of the faster development timeline, but there has not yet been a process. And so that's really the nugget of what we would love for you to weigh in on tonight. And that additional amount is $1.8 million for the other 18 units that we've not done a process for. I think with all this information, we should give the individuals and the, those missing time. I know that I've had the chance to look at some of this, but that's because I talk to you and see you all the time. But I know that people who are just looking at this or haven't had enough time to hear from you and then um, kind of digest this wouldn't be able to respond as in depth as, they, as, as this memo would require. So. Um, Dr. Holt, I'm asking for, for this group to have more time and when everyone else comes so they can at least read this and know what's what. I appreciate that. Um, I think that where we are, especially with the amount of committee members tonight, we're not in positions to make decisions in regard to anything that would require a decision. It's great to have the information, ask any questions pertaining to that information. But, um, 
yeah, we're not in a place to make a decision in regard to you one way or another at this moment. Any questions I can answer while I'm here and Lisa, Cupid, Virgie, while you're here this evening? Thank you for being here. We really appreciate your time. I get it. I totally get this. I just was not, uh, this wasn't doing it for me. I understand the point and the question completely. Um, I think it would be helpful if we're going to discuss this at another meeting to front the discussion with that question because I don't think we're going to have a very productive conversation like via this color coding chart um, because it just doesn't, that's not what matters. What matters is the question which you just raised, which is articulated very clearly now that it's about this phase two question. So, you know, just in general, my, you know, I always want to know what the alternative is. If you're asking me to say yes to thing X, what is the thing I'm foregoing? Like, what's the alternative? Is there an alternative? Mm -hmm. Is the alternative? Obviously, it's not a very specific alternative, but is it putting out another NOFA for this money? Or? There's actually a very specific alternative. Oh, so okay. if the oversight committee tonight clearly actually is not going to, you know, is not able, lack of quorum, to vote, um, the AWE collaborative has enough money that they can do the whole 30 units on that site, and that's potentially how they will proceed. If there is, if the bureau is not able to provide clear direction prior to the next oversight committee meeting, which is in I don't know the 11th of January, um, yeah, they'll go ahead and they'll acquire the land and develop all 30 units for this, their share of the 65 households. That's the alternative, probably. So the alternative is to have the same amount of home ownership units without allocating an additional 1.8 million dollars. The other projects on that list and that color coding would not would not happen. So the reason that the Housing Bureau asked them not to do all 30 units on one site is because we wanted a diverse portfolio of home ownership types, locations, and whatnot um, for the households that are on the preference policy list currently. And so the other option is that they don't do what's listed there and they do all 30 units. Um, of Kilpatrick with the resources that have already been allocated to them through a competitive process. The lost me. Okay, so the unit number doesn't change. It would just mean that 30 of the current 65 people would all end up living on the same, in the same space, space versus right. 12 out of the current 65 and 18 out of the next round. So that you don't, you're not take, forcing 30 people out of the current round to say this is your only option. So we wanted to have several options for this first round, mm -hmm. and so otherwise. Right, but either way, there's 1.8 million dollars will be allocated to this additional 18 units. It's, it's possible that would that is an option that is an option B. If the additional $1.8 million is not allocated, will there be the additional 18 units? Will there be 30 units? No, Steve is saying no. Great. Do you, do you want? So the yeah. alternatives are, let me see if I can say what the alternatives are. One is to say, oh no, do all the units right now for $4 million of this money. I don't care which money it is, but $4 million is going to be 30 units and everyone who's in the queue now will have access to those. The second alternative is this gets split up, the same amount of money and the same amount of units get split up into a phase one and a phase two. But the third alternative is like, there isn't really a third alternative, right? There isn't an alternative that says, nope, you can't have this $1.8 million Oh well, bye bye to those 18 units. That doesn't sound like that's really an alternative. That, that is, actually, that is an alternative where we say we're not going to allocate directly to Habitat and we're going to go through a competitive process and put that money out there. Uh, the challenge is that we know we have a project now and we know that the units can be developed. But I thought that they're, the f first part of the project is dependent on having 30 units, that the financing package is dependent on having 30 units on the site. I would ask. 
Steve to come to the table. Let Steve come on up. Thank you. Um, I think the part that we're, we're not following is we're asking to swap our NOFA fifth project, which has $1.5 million committed to it. As Andrea put it, we would, for, we would turn down that NOFA, but really free up that 1.5 million to be dedicated to this 1.8 million. If that helps with the, the math of it. What we're, I mean, the whole reason we're talking about doing this is to provide the current folks who are anxious to start serving homes more quickly because that Olin project I mentioned earlier is ready to go, but that's round two. The project we have for round one is going to be a much longer development process. So it makes sense to do the one first for the first round of folks that are ready and take half of the other project and move it into the second round because it'll happen, it'll get developed later. It's not a perfect match one-to-one -one in terms of number, number of units. So there is an additional, I believe, all we're talking about is the additional $300,000 that's different between the 1.5 we have committed in the NOFA to the 1.8 we would need for that second round. Do you disagree with that? So you don't need the 1.5 anymore? We need it. We're going to do that. We're going to take that project. We're going to put it into the current round and use the uh, collaborative money that we already have dedicated to build that project. Sure. We're going to use that money to build the other projects. So we're going to right. swap the projects and the funds. But then how are you going to build the Olin project? With the uh, collaborative money that we already have committed. But you would need additional money. In the end of the day, are you getting, are you asking for an additional $300,000 or are you asking for an additional $1.5 million? I think we're asking for an additional $300,000. I'm not sure. Technically. <laughs> Technically. I think the challenge is we went through a NOFA project process and got awarded funds for a specific project for a specific round. Right. And now we're that asking for that That part actually makes change. sense to me, but that's not quite what this chart seems to suggest. This chart seems to suggest that each of these, pro one project is 1.5 million, one project is 1.8 million, mm -hmm. and you need both of those allocations of money to do all three of these projects. Mm -hmm that you would need 1.5 million for Olin, 1.2 million for Kilpatrick part one, and 1.8 million for Kilpatrick part two. That is correct. And the 1.8 million for Kirk Kilpatrick part two has not gone through a competitive process. Exactly. But we'd be giving okay. up the 1.5 from the process we went through. Right, but then you wouldn't be doing, I mean, I think the you confusion... need all three of those pots of money mm -hmm. to do all three of these projects. And we have. So in the end of the day, there's one project that you would need to be funded, that you would are asking this group to say, you can have that money without going through a competitive process because we want to have all three of these projects done. All the two parts of one project and the other project. Mm -hmm. Right? So let, yes. Okay, that's fine. I got it. Uh... That, I'm, not yes, I'm just okay. trying to make that clear because I don't think that's quite like uh, I just think maybe you'll work on this memo a little bit more so, and forget about the color coding part and make this like front this question because we're gonna have a really hard time talking about this at the next meeting with people who aren't here hearing this whole explanation now if it's not laid out extremely clearly what is at stake my understanding is that having 30 units on that site, from what the story you just told, having 30 units on that site won't, can't happen without this funding allocation because the pricing of the land or whatnot was dependent on having 30 units, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Great. Yes. Okay. But, but to clarify, start. we have all of the funds right now committed for all 30 plus 12. All of those homes have funding committed to them right now. 30 units through the AW Collaborative funds that are awarded to the AW Collaborative. 30 units at Kilpatrick. At Kilpatrick. And the 12 units that we were awarded the NOFA money from. So we're not asking for any more money, actually. We're just trying to swap the projects, but they don't swap evenly. And therefore, right. we're moving money between pots that the city's not comfortable moving without 
more conversation and process. That either our approval. That's literally the opposite to the question I just asked. <laughs> right. I so, just asked a question. Sorry, I'm just a little bit frustrated because late at night. I just asked a question, does this mean there's an additional $1.8 million that we're being asked to allocate without a competitive process? And the answer was yes. But you just said the answer to that question is no. So I really, that's the, the answer, fundamental <laughs> question. Does the Awe Collaborative already have all of this money that's been allocated or not? I think the problem, I, I think both are correct to some extent. The problem is that the, the, the Awe Collaborative has a set amount. So when we move out 18 units and we replace it with 12, we've got to fill that gap and we don't want to decrease the um, number of families or the amount of money for the first phase. So we're filling that in with other projects. So we're awarding more money to the other project, Kilpatrick, in order to fill the gap. So when the Bureau... I feel like I can't, I, um, yeah. Do you have $4.5 million right now from this bureau to build these three projects or no? Has yes. that been allocated? Like, am I, am I, have I so, missed the point completely? So the AWA Collaborative was awarded $3.3 million for, of the original $5 million. Mm -hmm. The mayor's office last week essentially said they can have another $1.5 million. Okay, so that's $4.8 million is what the AWA Collaborative has to spend. The pro okay, one so, of sorry, let me, uh -huh. let me pause for a second. So the mayor's office has already allocated additional money through a non-competitive process that this oversight committee did not no, have anything to do with. Right, yep, we presented that at the last meeting. Great, great, great. Okay. And in addition to the 1.8 million, or 4.8 million, we also have the 1.5 million committed through the NOFA process. So all of that's committed money. We're not asking for an additional amount on top of that. Okay. So then I'm just, again, I'm back to this question of like, what's the practical implication of what we're being asked to consider? The practical implication is not a net change in an amount of money. It is not like a, Right? It's the same amount of money. It's not a net change in the amount of units. It is just only the question of whether the swap out is going to allow for a second round of people to have a different choice or the first round of people to have more choices. That's the, really the practical question here. I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, is, it's, so I it's, would write that down yeah. as the actual practical question yes. because this really has very little to do with the budgetary. Like, I understand that it has to do with the budgetary question, but that's not the we're being asked about like a goal or a principle or concept yeah. here. Mm -hmm. I trust that you know how to work out the back end of it or the legalities. I'm not concerned about that. I, I mean, I, this sounds in principle like a smart idea. Yeah. Give people more choices and get the thing done faster. That's, that sounds fine to me. It's just changing it from 30 to 12 and 18 with the second round getting a chance at the 18 instead of everyone from the first round getting all 30. Yep. Yeah. That's Much more simpler said. So. Right. Do we have any other questions about this? We're, we're pressed on time, and I want to make sure that we've got room for public testimony. We've got uh, two people signed up. So are we good for tonight? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, we've got two individuals signed up for public testimony. That's exciting. Haven't had that in a little bit. Uh, if you see on your public testimony card, those who did sign up, you've got a three-minute limit. Uh, for your time frame, and I will begin that after you are here and seated. So our first person, I believe, is Sylvia Alexander. You're still here? Wonderful. Right here at the table. We're excited about you being here. Thank you so much. And you have three minutes. Okay. Well, I'll be pretty brief because I don't 
uh, know too much about the history of the interstate um, corridor. And I, I guess um, I just heard about this meeting kind of late, and um, thanks for allowing public testimony. So um, I, you know, know about the history of the neighborhood, but where the um, interstate renewal boundary is is um, delineated, I'm not sure where I can find information on why it's the, why it's very specifically delineated there, and um, that would um, go to the second piece of it, which is for, this is for funding for people who assistance for down payment. Sorry to not, um, and then the second piece of it is. Why is there not any flexibility, or is there any flexibility possible in people who might find a house two blocks out of that boundary not being allowed to get that homeowner's assistance? Um, so that, those are my questions, and I guess they, the, the bigger point is when you're shopping for something, it's best to have um, you know, flexibility to shop in areas, even, even if this is the historical black neighborhood, as a home buyer now, I need to be able to get the best deal for my dollar, and um, so that I think it's really important for people to have some flexibility. And also, I wonder if not if um, funneling all these dollars into this particular area might not. I don't have the most faith in real estate agents. No offense, but that it might inflate prices a bit um, as well. So, okay. So just, just to answer your question, the dollars that we use for the down payment assistance are tax increment financing that were generated from the creation of the urban renewal area, which limits, limits us to only be able to use them within the URA. We are working with um, Prosper Portland to do an assessment of homes that are within 500 feet of the boundary and then 1,000 feet of the boundary to see how much land that would be if we did a uh, large expansion to incorporate some of those homes. But at this point, we are only able to use those dollars legally within the boundary of the URA. And is that by state law? Is yes. It? Okay. And, and to add on to Leslie's point, both of those take separate actions. Some can be something that's done by council, others cannot. Depends on the amount of um, square, uh, not square footage, but the amount of space, basically acreage, yeah, uh, that you're trying to extend the URA. So they take two separate specific actions. Like closer would be easier, but it still requires an action compared to like 0.25 of whatever, so. Okay, do I still have a little moment left of time? I'll give you a shot. Okay, um, so if after some period of time this um, isn't reaping the kind of benefits that you'd like to see, is there a possibility to, um, I don't know, reconfigure this so that people do have the ability to kind of look anywhere in the city? Is there any way that that could be? Um, so we, we have limited uh, citywide dollars for down payment assistance, and we have agencies that we work with that we give those dollars to, but we currently have funds in the Lynch URA and the Interstate URA, and again, we can't use those outside of those boundaries. Um, you know, we do our best to try to get as much citywide resource as we can, and that's basically city general fund um, or federal dollars. We know that the federal programs are um, on the potential cut list as we speak uh, from the current administration, but you know it's always a possibility. I won't say it's an absolute no ever, but right now this is what we're limited to. And I would encourage you to follow up with uh either Leslie or Javier Mena. Javier, you want to identify yourself? He's trying to tie his shoe. <laughs> the assistant director of the Portland Housing Bureau who could help give okay. you further direction and clarification. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Absolutely. Happy to help. Sherelle Edwards. Did I say that correctly? No, Sherelle Edwards L. Ah, Sherelle Edwards L. Thank you. Sir. You bet. <clears throat> Absolutely. You've got three minutes. Starting now. Okay, good evening. I would like to identify myself as one of the 
uh, I guess, recipients. I haven't actually received any of the funding yet, mm -hmm. but I was one of the first round people to be identified that I'm part of the preference policy. Um, and so I'll, it's been a couple years, um, and I just want to put a face to the group of people that decisions are continuing to be uh, made about because I was born in Portland and Kaiser, Hospi Kaiser Hospital over on Greeley Avenue. So um, I graduated from Portland Public Schools. Um, my daughters are in a Mandarin Immersion Program at Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary where I graduated myself. And um, we currently live in the neighborhood, but it has been a struggle. Um, we have seen our family uh, pass away, lose homes, be forced out of the neighborhood into other areas. Um, so what I wanted to talk about that's on your agenda today is, um, you know, how it says that most of the funding is strategically uh, being put in place for buyers that are at or below 80% of the median family income. And um, I looked at some of the projects where it lists the different units and what type of funding will be coming, and Section 8 was listed on some of those. And I just want to point out that there's a major problem right now that maybe you all won't correct in the next couple years, um, but hopefully in the next decade, and I hope the people from the city are still here to hear this. Um, but has, I don't know, I, I'm almost at my three minutes, but my point is, there's been a poster around that says, equality is not equity, okay? And so if there's a very tall person looking over a fence that comes here, and there's a shorter person trying to look over the fence, but the fence is here, and there's an even shorter person down here that wants to look over the fence, and the fence is up here, if the preference policy is in place to help people who have been historically impacted by displacement and racial gentrification, and you say, hey, we're going to give everyone a box, and we're going to distribute them, them, distribute them through these agencies that we're partnering with. That's equality. That's saying, okay, you all get a place to live, and the disabled people who are probably going to get Section 8 for the rest of their life can continue to stay in these small, compact areas, while the well-to-do can live on acres and rent out their property and have additional units and make income off of them. I'm one of the 65 people in the first round who has been blocked just like people have been blocked traditionally. I can't go out and get a realtor and use this funding to buy a house in the area where I grew up, north or northeast Portland, because it's two blocks outside of the boundary. Okay, so an investment in a property where I could go and be owner occupied and be able to rent out part of the property and make income off of it, that's my three minutes. I'm just saying that opportunity would help me to sustain and develop generational wealth for me and my children who are living in poverty instead of wealth for the agencies that you continue to partner with that aren't putting the wealth into the citizens and the residents of Portland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hopefully you won't take off before we are done. Great, because I'd love to talk to you. Excellent. Well, thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, we have... Thank you. If you look at your agenda, again, we have our next meeting coming up in January uh, 2011. And as you can tell, we have so... I mean, 2018, uh, January 11th, 2018. As you can tell, there are so many items for us to talk about and think through. And there's so many elements and aspects to the work that is involved. And while um, it was asked, it wasn't asked tonight, but one of the things that was asked was, how do, you, we, how do we get something on the agenda? How do we get a topic talked about? You can do that one of three ways. One is you can grab one of the people who works for the city or myself and say, hey, here's something that's very important and we can begin to interact with that. Or you can email, hopefully you've got the email information, and or you can call the Portland Housing Bureau. Because I've said it before and I wanna say it again, the whole goal of the Oversight Committee is to make sure that the process is uh, transparent, that it is responsible, and that it is community engaged. So as we interact with the partners and or the city itself, and some of you had that You've had the opportunity to hear us interact with the city and city representatives themselves. Our goal is to make sure that the promises that have been made are the promises that are being kept. And when we are falling down or when those things aren't happening, we need to know about it. 
so it can be addressed. So um, our city council annual presentation will be last week of or the first week of January. We're still working on the time certain. And as soon as we have that, we will let you know. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We appreciate your time and um, have a wonderful Thursday evening. Please take any food left over for those who are hungry. <laughs>